So happy Women's Day. Today, so many things uh, synchronized. Sunday, uh, full moon, Women's Day. It's like, wow, it's a destiny. Let me turn into my presentation mode. There are some uh, interesting technical things I need to do. All right, it's here. This is so cool. I just love learning every day something from technologists. This is one of my, I think, fetish. <laughs> from my corporate years working in IT, I just love it. All right, so here we are with Conscious Eating. We are going to start and whoever joins, they can uh, watch replay video later. So Conscious Eating is so important for us. Is extremely biggest part of our uh, life. Woman and food relationship is so um, sensitive. It's so overwhelming. It's so personal. Sometimes we are lost. Sometimes we are having such um, intimate and good relationship with food. Sometimes it just messes up. So uh, today, it is highly important for women to understand how we eat and what we eat is because as you see this amazing uh, picture here, you see all this roundness and curves is actually the manifestation of us being, uh, we are the nutrition, we are carrying the uh, art of eating inside of the body. So this does not relate only to those who were feeding, breastfeeding or giving birth. It doesn't matter. Even if a woman decides that instead of having children, she will have dogs, she is still a nurturer constantly because there is a sense of external eating and internal inside of the woman. So if woman will establish this um, relationship from inside, what is her relationship with food? The whole life, um, you know, it just reflects in everything. You will see through the whole presentation how it reflects in your relationship, in your sexuality, in your, in your even earnings, everything. Uh, in your recovery and recharge. So um, the sexuality and sensuality is the biggest part of it because you know when we are, um, we have breasts and we have nipples and nipples have so many uh, nerve ends and they are actually, uh, the stimulation of uh, nipples uh, produces oxytocin which um, makes the uterus contract. So when women give birth, first thing that they need to do is put the baby to uh, start uh, sucking because that is not just feed the baby because through that stimulation of the nipple, the uterus will start coming back to its sizes. And this is what happens after labor, but it also, we feel that during um intimate uh, moment with a man you know women are so sensitive when their breast is stimulated you can sense or maybe you just get a general arousal or some women can actually sense when their uh, nipples are stimulated there is some movement very subtle movement in the uterus and that gives you the arousal so when you are uh, um, when woman is um, experiencing uh, breastfeeding, that is the most intimate and sexual act uh, that we have in human. So the uh, baby is latching and right now he is uh, receiving life force, not just the food because it's like, okay, milk, right? So what is milk? It's, it's the most potent and fruitful and nutritional um, liquid that it is on earth that makes the baby grow so fast. So uh, this act later is imprinted in us. So when we see, um, when men see naked breast, they have reaction. I have, I really love woman's breast. 
and like seeing woman's breast for me is I have, you know, I wouldn't say that it's some sexual arousal, but it arouses me on some like animal instinct, which is related to the time when I was breastfed. So you imagine if I am a small baby and there is a boob of my mother, all I can see is this boob and it's huge, it's like the size of my head. So my relationship with that is feeding and it's uh, the pure sexuality where you have this uh, straight connection with the motherly sexual energy that created you. So that's why the food is life. And when we turn away from that boob or uh, the relationship with food in our life, we somehow cut the cord with the life. So such um, when I work with women who have eating disorders, like I met some women with bulimia or anorexia, it all broke down that they have big um, internal issues or imprinted drama in the body that was related to motherhood. It doesn't have to be necessarily only with their biological mother. It can be with your internal mother because everyone that is around you, they are firstly inside of you. So now we're going to dive to understand what is external and internal um, food right so one thing is as i'm talking uh and if you have questions disagreements uh comments whatever for you not to forget just throw it into the chat and then we will look at it because at the end of this class we're going to have q a and one more thing uh, I ask everyone to prepare a prop. So your prop should be an apple or a banana or something that you can actually eat towards the end. So if you don't have it, if you didn't prepare it, just go and do that now. And I'll give it one minute and uh, then we will start. Yeah. So um, I always do practice at the end, which is the wrapping up and it's actually the main thing it is the shortest part here but in your life it should be the longest <laughs> so i'm giving you an example how to how to eat actually which is great all right so we will begin with external all right so external eating what do we eat we eat food right why i've put this funny picture here food addiction is because we are addicted to food so we are having this relationship of attachment even before we are born without it we will die so before we are born and until we die we are somebody who are 100 percent relying on food so it's in a way addiction uh, but this addiction can be in a sense of positive and sometimes overwhelming negative. So external eating is when you are drawn to food by five senses. So you look at the food, you know, you're walking on the street and this happens to me around PMS. So I'm walking on the street and all I can see is science, pizza, burger, something and i'm like Ugh. my my mouth is watering and i'm drooling and i'm just like i know i know it's just my sense right now that is really vulnerable and attaching to these uh things that i want to stop myself with so we look at the food and we think that we want that food we smell ah chocolate coffee coffee smells amazing i actually don't like coffee at all and i don't drink it but i really like the smell it's a very it it awakens something right so actually our five senses even in um meditation in yoga practice everything uh whatever you do the five senses are the gate or the doors for us to perceive the world. Most of the time, these filters are not conscious. So we are uh, acting in life based on how these senses will drive us. So if it comes to the food, it's like, oh, I'm hearing 
my mother is chopping something and then suddenly I feel hungry. So I smell a meat uh, and I want a steak. I saw a pizza on, I don't know, you know, on Instagram, somebody is making something. So we are drawn on that. But the thing is that five senses can trick you. They do not allow you to often understand when is enough. So let's say today when you go to a cafe, especially, you know, those cafes that are given healthy foods, they will give you a huge bowl of salad. Normally, this amount is like good for three people, but you will. And while you are talking with somebody or you are being distracted, so your senses are working externally and you're just, wow, the salad is nice and you're eating, eating. And there is a moment. When you put your spoon or fork down and then you take a pause, it's unconsciously. You put it down, you don't even notice, and then you take it again and continue eating. So actually in the relationship of food, when the first time when you put your tool down, it means it's a somatic response that your body is saying it's enough. But the senses are... Um, no, I would say the mind is blurred, is uh, driven by senses. You take the fork again and you continue eating. And most of the time we are eating because uh, we need to finish the plate. So I was uh, raised in a family. Well, I was hyper skinny kid and I had very bad appetite, which bad was judged by my parents and by my family. Normally, you know that kids do not want to eat a lot, but we stuff them. So I was always pushed to finish my plate. And my, <laughs> my, my cousin who used to always babysit me, she was like, you are not going to stand out of this table until you finish your food. So I would uh, force myself. There is this um, society belief that leaving food on your plate is bad because for example there are people in africa starving and you are not respecting the food so it's a waste so i want to give uh, another perspective of looking at it first of all nothing is wasted when you throw food it eventually goes to the earth so it's fertilizing and everything will be absorbed and fertilized by earth even plastic everything so just plastic takes uh maybe thousands of years but eventually earth will transform whatever we are throwing to her uh which it doesn't mean we need to pollute okay this is a different topic uh, i don't want to go there but when you are throwing food it depends on what intention you are doing it if you are thinking that now i feel bad because i invested money i cooked and there are starving people and I feel bad. This is just provoking your sense of guilt. But if you are throwing food with gratitude is actually, okay, I ate half of the plate. I'm so grateful and I feel my body is telling me this is enough. Then I'm going to not throw. I'm going to let go of this food and I know where it's going eventually. First of all, if you are in Canada, uh, there is um, compost, so everything is recycled. And I actually really like that I'm investing something in compost. If you are not in Canada, then perhaps you can do start doing that and use that compost for something. But knowing that in general, it all becomes compost. But if you're thinking of other people who are starving in Africa, so how... If you're going to stuff and push yourself to eat whole plate, how are you helping those kids in Africa? I don't understand. This is like really funny. So first of all, you are damaging your body by overeating because of guilt. So you are eating that guilt and you are not helping the kids in Africa. So perhaps maybe you can start putting less on your plate. Uh, being aware of like how much and when is enough. So um, that's how you can sense that food is very necessary. You cannot detach from it, but it doesn't have to be an addiction. And uh, women, 
who are, no, I would say every single woman, even the most um, evolu uh, evolved woman or most developed spiritually, energetically, will go through phases of like being addicted and being okay being addicted and being okay so we have indulgence and cravings because we are cyclical women and we are rhythmical so we have our hormones uh, which are actually dancing and changing for the month so somewhere you will want that pizza and maybe you will even eat so you have to be also aware that you can allow yourself that there is a moment you are doing that consciously so if you are PMS and you are like, oh my God, I really need that steak or hamburger, whatever. Okay. So you are going to do that consciously because right now your body is just screaming. Like, you know, that newborn baby who is like Wah! screaming and wants the boob. So you're going to take that, but you don't need to eat everything. So you are uh, pleasing your body in small portions and then you are establishing this kind of relationship where you start to understand the language of your body now uh this is something i really want to go deep today which is chinese meridian clock it is very similar to circadian rhythm which is more known in the western um society but chinese meridian clock gives you a very uh deeper perspective and this is how i live uh, one thing to know i'm here <laughs> one thing to know that never ever in your life any woman should force anything in life so if for example i'm showing you this clock and you're like oh my god this is so amazing i'm gonna follow it 100 percent no you're not gonna follow anything 100 percent ever in your life because you are a woman because every time when you put yourself into a certain uh very strict frame that is a violence so anything that i'm offering you today you are taking that and you need to experiment that experience that so it's an experiential we are we are scientists who are using our bodies constantly to understand what works for you what doesn't so now let's jump to the uh, chinese meridian clock so i'm going to start this is all this um let me translate actually first so these are the uh, organs there are some organs that are not very known in a couple of them in uh, western medicine and i will translate that the numbers uh, signify the hour okay so 24 hours in the day solar day now i'm going to start from 5 a.m because this is when i wake up and this is actually <laughs> when we we, we need to wake up and I will explain why, but it doesn't mean you need to wake up every morning now 5 a.m., okay? You can experience that. So 5 a.m. is a time when your large intestine meridian works. So these are not just organs, but these are the meridians of these organs that pass through your body, from upper body to your feet, and this is where um, they pass energy. So large intestine has its meridian and they are not separate from each other. If you think of it, your body is like an ocean and these are streams or currents. They inter uh, cross each other, they uh, um, stimulate each other or they deplete each other. So large intestine, starts working at 5 a.m. Each, uh, each organ works for two hours. When large intestine is active, it means that this is a moment when you wake up and first thing you do, you go to poop, okay? So now I wanna uh, um, add something here. So if you are somebody who wakes up with alarm, if you remove that alarm so there was a time when we didn't have alarms right what wakes people up did you ever think like you are deeply asleep and then suddenly you open your eyes and you're like oh i'm awake what did wake you up we might think it's like noise 
or somebody did something there is a light so there is external but there is something internal so if you imagine that your uh, room is pitch dark and the, there are no sounds you will still wake up so what wakes you up your large intestine so the movement in your bowels is so subtle, but in other ways, the large intestine sending signal to your brain that it's time to wake up because you need to discharge. You need to eliminate the processed food. Now, this is the reason why you wake up and the uh, large intestine is designed the way that it is ready to uh, eliminate processed food in between these hours. Now, the sign that your digestion is in a healthy state is when the first thing you wake up and you go to toilet. You are not forcing it, it happens naturally. And funny thing is that today, many of us, we need some stimulants. So we need a glass of water or many uh, people need to drink coffee and then they say, and then I go to toilet and it works perfectly. Some people need to eat something. So it's amazing that this is actually disruptive. This is how um, initially our body was designed, but today's lifestyle, technologies and different kind of uh, artificial food or food with uh, external alien hormones disrupted our uh, genetic, I would say, uh, map, so it changes, but we can still reverse that. Now, going back, um, so there are ways of how you can actually do that if you wake up and drink a little bit of warm water. So you shouldn't drink anything cold, and we will, um, I will jump into that just in a moment, or Exercise. So breathing actually uh, works directly on digestion. So you can relate um, relate to that through the labor. You know, when when the labor of a woman is happening, she's about to give birth. What are the doctors telling her? She needs to breathe. Why breathing? Because it relaxes all the passages in the pelvis that makes you uh, to birth. So actually in the morning when you are going to the toilet, you are in a way birthing. So you can actually take breathing exercise to recover your digestion. But if you are someone who is taking coffee first thing to go to that, you are actually ruining your digestion. So in the large intestine, it's not only about uh, okay, go into toilet. It's a time for practice. It's the best time to do some kind of practice. So uh, in terms of the hour, it is before the sunset. So in holy scripts, in yoga practice, like when, when you, if you do anything in India, yeah, you wake up and very first class is very early or meditation is before the sunrise. So these hours are uh, supposed or named to be the holy hours when you are receiving a special prana or chi or energy. So before the sun rises, they say that the hour before the sunrise is the most quiet hour like there is a moment when everything goes to complete silence so these hours are meant to be golden when you can perceive something directly from creator okay so this is a perfect time to uh, practice something now the next hour to hour of the stomach is actually a time when you are supposed to have your first breakfast so the breakfast is something that should be hot. Actually, breakfast is the first meal, is the most uh, important meal because it is, um, it is investing in production of serotonin. So the, if I would say the sizes of the meal, the breakfast should be not just big, right so you have many ingredients it should be very healthy and potent with because that 
um, in the morning when uh, you have a healthy breakfast that will stimulate the production of serotonin, which is known as the sun hormone. And the production of serotonin will in the evening echo in production of melatonin. So melatonin is actually helping you to sleep and rest and recover during night. But if your breakfast was poor or very like, you know, uh, just running. So I, I don't think, no, we don't have women who are working in offices uh, today, uh, but there are majority of them out there on the street. And you know, the way they eat, it's like, they're not even having breakfast. It's just like having drinking and running to the office and maybe on the way grabbing something. So I'm, I'm happy that we don't have anyone here like that, but still maybe you can give more attention to your breakfast. So uh, the breakfast what is the trend today? This is how a healthy breakfast looks like today. Some uh, very nice charged water and a salad, right? Uh, and even, even lunch can look like this because it's a trend today to go on vegan, vegetarian and something raw. The thing is that is completely breaking our digestive system because look at this, uh, sorry this skin. So on the right side, you see that the below belly and digestion, including uterus, including bladder, including liver and kidneys is a hot. It relates to this, uh, another picture, which is a pot. So uh, the fire is the abdomen, lower abdomen um, space. You know, the temperature in your stomach is so high. It's super hot there. It's like plus 90 degrees in Celsius. It is uh, supposed to be so hot because it's a place of digestive fire. This is where the alchemy of cooking. So you are cooking your food externally, then you're putting it inside and it continues the process of cooking. So it means that whenever you are eating something cold, you are uh, fading that fire. You are not um, helping your stomach, your digestion to process the food, to cook the food like on all levels in a very, very um, correct way. So we have a tendency to eat something cold or let's say you cooked something, but then by the time you sat and ate, it's already cold. So it's very important to keep your lower belly internally from your digestion hot because that will produce and help also your reproductive organs. So when it's hot here, that can, uh, comes into next level, which is the heart, the lungs. This part needs to be warm the breathing is warm, the heart is warm, and it stimulates the blood. So um, many of us experiencing very overwhelming uh, menstruation where there is even blood clots, it's because the blood is cold. And this is also in Chinese medicine, uh, uh, cold blood is um, an outcome of dampness and coldness in the body. So changing food, and also there are other things like exercise, breathing, but today it's only food. Changing food will drastically change your cycle and your emotions. So if the uh, chest area, the heart center is warm, then the uh, it goes into more um, cooling down effect towards your head. In this way, you are having clear mind. So today, what happens? If I'm somebody who loves salads and all of this raw and vegan stuff, so I'm creating the coldness, dampness in, uh, around my digestion. The emotions are rising and it goes upside down. So it's boiling hot head boiling hot heart and cold feet, cold kidneys and cold digestion. So it's upside down. And many of us live like this. Even when I go out to the streets in Vancouver, what do I see? 
in winter, there are ladies who are literally wearing hat, big puffy coat, and just tiny jeans that show ankles, naked ankles, and like uh, sneakers, or how do you say that? Shoes, yeah, sneakers? I think so. Okay, so shoes. So it means that everything here is held in warmth and feet are in coldness and they don't sense. They do not sense in the body that it is producing this completely disrupted upside down cycle. And then as a result, it's a overwhelming menstruation. It's a hormonal uh, disruption and stiffness in the body because joints so because if the lower part of the body is supposed to be warm it creates kind of fluidity you're like a wax yeah you're like a honey warm honey so your joints are fluid but what do we see we see this we see this and then we go into gym so this is what i see on the streets so now what you can feel is that your lower body is a massive uh, fire center and then towards the uh when the alchemy is happening just like in the pot so there is a fire then there is a boiling and cooking and there is steaming steaming goes up through your head and this is where the energy is flowing right it's very subtle all right so now these are the hours when you are eating and then the spleen is going to the next um, phase. So spleen is an organ that is sitting just behind the stomach. Funny thing is that in, I just want you to see me, so I'm gonna here, go here. So uh, it's funny that in Western medicine, they say that spleen is actually one of those organs that are not so important so if somebody will have a surgical extraction of spleen you can still live and be healthy which actually chinese medicine and Taoist practice and like even uh ayurveda is saying that spleen is so important the energies of spleen is very important on an energetical level spleen holds the balance or the location of the organs in your body so your liver is not just a physical organ it has also a subtle phantom energy right through which the meridian energy is flowing everything has its place and this is your map so your liver is supposed to be here your heart's supposed to be here and spleen is that um, organ that is responsible to hold the space to hold everyone is in its place so the prolapse doesn't happen spleen is converting uh the energy from the food and pass it it's uh, passes it through the body so uh stomach they work together so stomach um is digesting the gross food the physical and pass it to the intestine and etc and the spleen is breaking down the energy and feeds the blood, the uh, liver, your heart, and etc. During this time, what you're supposed to do, it's the best time to work. So you exercised, uh, you breathed, you, you breathed, and then you ate, and now it's time to work. This is when your mind is super clear uh, from 9 till 11 is the best time to study, to do some like computer work, to do some intellectual or like, I don't know, hold meetings and whatever. Now, next phase from 11 to 1 p.m. is heart. Oh my God. This is like, <laughs> this is the tragedy of, I think, the whole society because look what's happening we most of us at least once in life worked in a condition of like five days in a week from nine till six or if you are not working you are a freelancer and you're entrepreneur you at least have clients like that 
So because you have clients like that, they will influence your schedule. So what happens from 11 till 1 p.m. is a heart meridian and heart is the most fragile organ. When it is an hour of heart, it means you need to actually rest. So what happened in our society is that around that hour, we are experiencing very overwhelming lunch or people during the lunch break, they go to exercise and they go to do something very strong like gym or like a power yoga class. Yeah, let's go and sweat and do some cardio. It's crazy. So it's actually putting extra pressure on the heart. And uh, what happens is that heart attacks are like massive. And heart attack, it's not something can be, oh, and you faint and there is uh, ambulance and whatever. Heart attack can be very subtle. It can be just palpitation, uh, like uh, abnormal beating. It can be sweating. You're just like feeling, oh, or dizziness, you know? So if it's all coming from the heart. Now the heart is an organ that wants peace. So it's funny that if you are around lunch having overloading heavy meal, after the lunch, you're going to experience a huge breakdown in the energy. So we are falling asleep. It's like, oh my God, I need to lay down and have my siesta, which is by the way, siesta in Spain. Uh, where else? I don't remember. So uh, in, in Israel, so there are countries that are having a napping time around three, two, three or four. Actually, the best time to have a short um, nap, power nap, like 20 minutes, 40 minutes, not more than one hour, is between 11 and 1. Wow, you're going to re, um, restore so much of energy and your heart will be so grateful for that. So um, then what should you do with the meal? So I can tell you from the way I do it, and then you can experience and play around. So I work until 11, and then I take a pause. I read something. I just, first of all, I go out of all the technologies and I rest my senses. I can lay down, I can do meditation, I can read something really like calming, soothing, like, I don't know, whatever, philosophy book. Or I'm taking a nap. It depends on how I feel. If I'm really feeling a nap, I'm going to nap. This is where you understand. It's not that every day you are doing the same thing. And after, I'm going to eat. And that actually, the lunch that I'm having doesn't have to, I don't feel like I need a big lunch because my breakfast was so like nourishing that I'm still in a way feeling that breakfast so I'm eating something really uh, smaller and also nutritional and then the energy uh, in the next hours is still high you can actually, you know, take a book, read and not fall asleep. You don't feel that you are done for the day. So because many people after the lunch, they are done for the day. They are ready to rest, but they have to work. So they force themselves. After the heart, we have small intestine. So the small intestine is uh, a time. Actually, from this time, you can start also, this is a, another phase of very nice um, time to do some mental intellectual or like uh, work or communicational time. So the bladder and kidneys, 7 p.m. marks a time when you are having your last meal and last drink. So actually according to your organs, they don't want anything after 7 p.m. 
Now, uh, I want to say something about drinking a lot of water, right? So you have to drink two liters a day, which is not quite correct. The, first of all, two liters uh, of water per day does not mean the water itself. You are receiving fluids through vegetables, fruits, and uh, just food. This counts as well. So you can invest in that two liters. What happens is that because this uh, a trend, a massive trend, everybody is walking with bottles of water and drinking all day long which puts extra pressure on kidneys so the way you can measure if you had enough if if you are running to pee often and if your urine is almost transparent it's a sign that you have too much water so if a very dark color of the urine is not healthy as well it's a sign of inflammation or something is like inflamed in the body so it's a balance it's a very good yellow color you know how healthy urine looks and then you can even experiment one day like drink drink uh, uh, i don't know three cups of water and then go to toilet you will see that every time you go it becomes more transparent more transparent lighter and lighter so when we are drinking that amount extra overwhelming amount of water we put extra pressure on kidneys and kidneys they are supposed to um, eliminate a certain part of the water and a lot of water needs to stay in the body right and the thing is that the water that you drink in the bottle like just a normal water you are peeing but it means your water goes in and goes out faster. It doesn't stay. But the water that comes with the food, soup, veggies, and um, fruits, it actually stays because it's inside of the fibers. So it stays. So I would, for example, me, I have special relationship with kidneys. I drink, this will be the only cup I drink throughout the day. So we are all different. And when you read something like, you should drink two liters of water per day, it's not absolutely correct for everyone because everyone's kidneys capacity is different. You need to understand and track through your bladder. So this is a time when you are slowing down. So uh, today also it's a trend that uh, many of us are having actually dinners after seven. Well, we are invited somewhere or to be honest, in my country, in my family in Kazakhstan, by the time I'm going to bed here at nine, they are actually starting having dinner. And for me, it's like, this is crazy because you're supposed to sleep and you're, it's not just you need to sleep, you must sleep. Yeah. It's because you're organs are prepared to rest but you are instead of allowing them to rest you are forcing them to work and that steals from your sleeping that steals from your energy that steals from your hormones so if the, we are speaking now about the perfect day yeah so you had your third meal if you are having one around so let's say at the end of small intestine bladder and maybe beginning of kidney uh, hours. And that's it, that's it. So this will allow you to have really deep sleep and many today wake up during night to urinate or to drink. The thing is, if you are waking up at night, it's not, uh, it's a sign that something is not working correctly. Uh, there is a timing between you should not in a normal state wake up until you are actually 60, 70. You are, uh, it's possible not to wake up, to, to, to sleep like all these full hours. So uh, sleeping does not mean sleeping the whole night. There are certain hours which actually driven by melatonin when you can sleep in a very deep way. So, but if I say, say uh, if I had my late dinner and I 
drank a lot of water today. Of course, my body will wake me up because I have excess. So my body wants to eliminate where it's supposed to be empty. And the way you, um, the way you spend your evening or the uh, uh, second half of the day will affect next morning. So this circle is like a karma. It's like a karma. What you did in the morning will affect noon, will affect evening, will affect night, will affect next day. And this is your wheel where you are either depleting or either you are growing your energy. Everything is about energy here. Now, when uh, you finished, so we finished everything at seven, there is an organ called pericardium. So it's written like this, yeah? So pericardium is not an organ in Western medicine. It's just a membrane that uh, is wrapped around your, around your um, heart, but it is a separate organ in Chinese medicine. Why? Because it plays such a crucial role. It's a guard. It's a um, guarding from any kind of physical shaking, you know, absorption of uh, absorption of the, uh, how do you say this, um, shaking or movement or like uh, if you fall, yeah, so it uh, protects. Uh, second, it protects and holds the heart. It takes uh, the first uh, impact it takes on itself. So heart is like, okay, I'm here, but there is a guard standing there and protecting me. And pericardium is also um, on energy level works as a protection. In a way, it needs to be relaxed as a gate and then more relaxation comes to your heart. So remember the heart is the only organ uh, that is actually pumping the blood all the time, that it doesn't stop. So even it has an hour where it's active, it's still active throughout your day. You're sleeping, you're talking, you're eating, the heart is, it's like breathing, yeah? It goes on and on and on. So because it's not uh, stopping, it's not having actual physical rest, it needs extra support through rest from you. And pericardium is also a moment when you need to rest. So pericardium hours is also an hour because of our busy lifestyle. It's an hour when people have tendency to do some strong workout. When actually here, it's a, it's, it can be a perfect time to physical practice, but what kind of practice? It can be some gentle stretching, walking. And people, what they do in this time, many people are jogging. Oh my God. <laughs> jogging is a cardio stimulating thing. So they jog, uh, they, they actually about jogging, I'm going to make a separate video because it's so important to understand how people are killing themselves through wrong jogging. So whether we wake up, after eight hours of being in total rest and we jump into jogging, which is very uh, damaging for the heart or people jogging in the evening during the pericardium hours. So heart attacks again, right? So heart attacks happen out of nowhere. And usually those who had like really severe heart attack, they're like, I don't know how it happened. My heart was fine. I'm, I was like fine and nothing happened, but this is, this is the reality. So here you can do some walking. Walking actually is a perfect thing, uh, practice for heart. Walking long distances, walking with awareness, walking in meditative state, not talking while walking, because when you are talking while you are walking, you are breathing with your mouth, and that is not very good for your um, lungs. So breathing deeply through your nose, walking is perfect. 
Now, by the time of 9 p.m., it's a time of triple burner. So what is triple burner? This is only in Chinese medicine. Triple burner is a not physical organ. It's a distribution of energy, right? So these are three parts, upper burner, middle burner, and lower burner. In these hours, everything that happened with you throughout the day is now going to smooth out and distribute evenly. So if you think of your body as a three uh, floor building, so there is too much light, for example, on the third, there is darkness in on second, and on the, uh, on the first floor, there is uh, too many people, right? So you want to distribute everything evenly. And this is a time when you are laying down and you're going to bed. So, <laughs> and also uh, after nine, it's a time when melatonin starts being produced in your pineal gland. So one thing about melatonin, melatonin is produced in complete darkness. Okay, because um, when we didn't have technologies and light yet, we were uh, living with uh, the light of the day and the light of the moon. So we would go to bed when it's dark because there is nothing else to do. So when uh, the sun sets at say, let's say uh, 7, 8 p.m., people would do what? Okay, they would maybe spend one more hour together I don't know, women used to knit or talk or like candles, you know, and then you are early going to bed because there is nothing else to do. So that was a very healthy for melatonin and the sleep was deep and very nourishing. Today we have phones and screens. So the light of screens and phones, yeah. So the light of the screens and phones have the blue or white light which disrupts directly to your pineal gland. So your pineal gland is thinking that right now it's a day. So melatonin should not be produced like, okay, there is a signal. There is a signal constantly on the pineal gland from the screen saying it's a day so you can be awake. So it's cheating, right? naturally if it's set if the sun sets you are about to sleep so what is happening when you are going to sleep in the first hours from nine till around 10 maybe you are tossing turning around hard to fall asleep so by the 11 you might be asleep and this is where melatonin goes into very strong uh production it's uh, continues throughout they say 3 4 a.m i think in general again it's very um different for everyone but yes from 11 till 3 and 4 this is the peak of hours and this is actually the hours that you should not wake up because it's a deep sleep your mind uh is off your subconsciousness is off this, if you heard that brain has different ways, so there are delta, theta, and deeper and deeper and deeper. So these are actually the deeper you go, the more recharged you are. So what happens during these hours? Gold bladder, liver, and lungs. These are the organs becoming active, but in this, they can only be active when you are only in deep sleep. The way they are active is that they are restoring your cells. So when you are sleeping deep, your cells that are old, dying, and these organs reproducing new cells. So lungs are reproducing blood. Uh, oh, sorry, liver is reproducing blood. Lungs is reproducing all the cells because basically you breathe with all your body the oxygen or the prana goes everywhere in your body so the deeper you sleep the more energy you have and then you wake up so that this is what i describe now the perfect day if you imagine living like this 
<laughs> can you imagine what kind of human you're going to become in in a month right so what happens then this is uterus kidneys liver heart spleen so this uh, image is coming from Neigon, uh, which translate as internal arts. So you know about Qigong, which is martial arts, and it's like very deep internal, but actually it's in uh, martial arts, it's still external practice. There is Neigon, which is more internal, where it's completely subtle energy. So in Neigon, what happens is that all these organs, throughout their cycle they are taking nutrition processing and then feeding the uterus so the liver is stored is storing blood throughout your cycle liver sends blood to the uterus where it combines with the energy of kidneys of i forgot why here to form menstrual blood now spleen generates the blood spleen holds up the uterus uh, the kidneys energy of kidneys sends to the uterus to form menstrual blood so when we think of this where does the blood come from right so we know about endometrial layer the tissues this is the physical but there is more there is more than just this blood there is fluids because actually the menstrual blood consists maybe like 10, 20 30% of actual uh, blood but there are more fluids so these fluids uh, if we talk on energy uh, language in energy language it's a breaking down of um, energy from organs so everything is pulling down towards that magnetic it's a magnetic field which has its own gravity so uterus has its gravity she will pull the energy in to create menstruation and then that will reoccur through ovulation so the correct way to menstruate will affect the correct healthy ovulation and why ovulation needs to be healthy and how do we actually measure if ovulation is healthy like we don't know <laughs> i mean i'm not gonna talk about it today but there is a question and there is an answer so when everything is working it's working together as one family that's why in uh in this Taoist practice your organs are your children they are your children, they are your family that are constantly interact, affect and uh, support each other. But if one organ is depleted, it's going to deplete the other by the chain reaction, right? So in, Eastern, uh, in Western medicine, what happens? If you have problems with liver, the doctor will look at your liver and heal the liver give medicine for the liver but in Taoist practice if your liver is disrupted oh then your kidneys are in this state and your heart is in this state because you are not separate because the western mind sees the body as dissected mechanical robotic way so this is arm this is head but no everything evolved from one cell so when you were in this phase of gestation in your mother's womb you were first just a, a, a drop of protein right of cell and then it started dividing 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 so everything is interweaved out of that one cell uh, remember one thing again that you don't need to panic now and change all your life this is first harm and violence on woman you understood now you need to observe and understand and uh, start playing, start moving something. And guess what is happening? Eventually you are coming to a lifestyle which you are the dictator of your schedule. And all the society needs to somehow adapt. But most of the time we live oppositely. Oh, because I have these guys at this time, 
or my kids are not sleeping at this time, or my husband wants sex or whatever, like anything, you know, you are uh, going to please others. And then your first family, which is right here, is being depleted. And then you cannot serve anyone if your energy is low. Now let's jump to the, uh, to the internal. So what happens internally in the body? When you are externally eating, you are just feeding your mouth. This creates addiction that I mentioned in the beginning, because you are, you want to taste, oh, I miss this meal, or oh, I miss that meal, I'm having cravings. So it's the mouth that is constantly wanting, but that is external. Internally, we need to feed, not the mouth, we need to feed our hormones on the left and on the right. So this is for menstruating women and this is for menopause women. So on uh, the left side, what do we have here? We have hypothalamus, which is a part of the brain, pituitary gland, pineal gland. We have the thymus, which is in a, behind the heart. Then it all breaks down and goes to affect our ovaries and the follicle process, the maturation of follicles. So actually, this bio, uh, bio uh, how to say, bio-living machine, okay, if I could say that, uh, has a program. It's programmed for only one purpose, for procreation, which is the ovaries. Every month, menstruating women are going through this and yeah, they are going through this. And this is the only way, if I would say in a very simple primitive language, this is the only reason we are alive. We need to reproduce, but it's not reproducing children only, it's reproducing yourself. So uh, this is actually the first reason you need to take care of yourself, not to birth children. Eventually, one day you want children, you are ready for that. But what about before? There are many women here who are not mothers, who are not even married yet. So it doesn't mean you are not birthing. You are birthing yourself constantly. So you are not supposed to feed your mouth. You are supposed to feed your hormones because hormones, they build up on the food that you take. Now, what happens with... Uh, menopausal. Menopausal women are not having that much relationship with ovaries, but with kidneys and adrenal glands right here. The adrenal glands are like hats, little hats sitting on top of your kidneys, and they produce estrogen, which we think uh, only in ovaries, but actually Estrogen is produced not only in ovaries, it's also present in your fat tissues, in your gut, and also in adrenal glands. So adrenal glands are producing testosterone, uh, which is responsible for sexuality and just being active. So um, for coffee lovers, coffee depletes adrenal glands. It stimulates them to produce more cortisol into the bloodstream, which causes you to feel very weak, yeah? And next day you want more coffee because you lost that energy, so you need to recover. So it's a uh, loop of negative reaction. So the more coffee you have, the more you deplete. The more you deplete, the more coffee you want. Or it doesn't have to be coffee. It can be any other product or food that causes uh, depletion of, horm of hormones. And we're going to talk about which kind of products are these. So for uh, menopausal women, they are still having their cycle. This is called H, so this is called HPO, which is hypothalamus pituitary ovaries axis. It means that this is a clock of three different glands that are constantly communicating together. And then in menopausal women, it's HPA, uh, because adrenals, right? So hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenals. So 
menopausal women are still living the cycle of movement of hormones, but they need to a little bit maybe look at it in a different way. So all of you are going to menopause. <laughs> I always say that there are two things guaranteed in our life, which is menopause and death. If you want some kind of stability, this is the most stable uh, fact in our life. Whether you are rich, white, black, I don't know, bold, or you haven't hair, it doesn't matter, you are going to menopause. And sometimes I hear from menstruating women like, Aliyah, I'm only 25 or I'm only 30. Why do I need to think of menopause right now? Well, actually, because menopause will become the karma of your menstruation. How you are treating your menstruation, you're going to experience your menopause. And today, menopausal women are uh, claiming so much suffering, so much overwhelming experience like hot flashes and mood swing and blah, 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 and lack of libido and so much things because they depleted their adrenal glands and their um, process of hormones. So basically when we are young, we are wild and sexy. We don't want to think about anything. We just want to be uh, validated and recognized we are indulging ourselves in life in food and drinks and everything but when time comes it's like oh now I'm paying actually what I deserve now uh, right so yeah so the goal of everything that you are eating or in fact everything that you are doing the goal is energy right the more energy you have the more you can manifest in your life, the more you can change in your life, the more time you have, the more time you can devote to yourself, the more time you can devote to your family, uh, the more you can, you have capacity to study or do whatever. So if you don't have energy, you will just be an, a human being who is enough for sleep, eat, poop, communicate, uh, repeat. That's all. But perhaps you're like, oh, one day I want to do this, or one day I want to do that. But you think I don't have time. Actually, you don't have energy because when you have energy, there is time. So energy equals time. So how do we get energy? We get energy throughout the day through thousands of ways, but there are four main which are right here. So you are gaining energy through your sleep, through your eating, through sex. And these three are for both women and men. And there is fourth through menstruation and uh, ovulation. So I just decided to put that picture. Yeah, <laughs> with a pad. So um, what does it mean that in these actions we gain energy? So in these actions, what happens is that if you think of me right now as an energy field, I'm like a cocoon, okay? I'm in my cocoon. During these four actions, this cocoon opens the door to receive something. So something comes in. When you are opening that door to sleep, you are relaxed, yeah? So you are receiving something. When you are eating, you are receiving literally food inside and energy. When you are menstruating and ovulating, wow, there is this is rejuvenation and restoration. When you are through uh, experiencing intercourse, you are literally spreading your legs, opening your vagina, opening your whole self to receive a man. So what happens is that in the state when you are receiving, it means that you are most vulnerable, most fragile, and most uh, susceptible to receive what? So what is entering you when you are sleeping? What is entering when you are having a uh, love process? What kind of man? Or how are you experiencing your menstruation, your ovulation is what you're going to receive because you are in that moment. So, you know, this system of receiving does not discriminate, does not choose. Okay, this is good and this is bad and it's all coming to me. So these doors will not close to this object 
and open to this object. You need to do that through conscious choice. Whatever comes in will come in, will enter. So it means you need to create a certain filter where you are like, no, before you even came to me, no. And this is coming from a mindset of actual conscious choices in your life how and where and when you are sleeping by the way when you are sleeping um, because both men and women are vulnerably opened if you are in relationship try to and you're constantly sleeping in the same bed with your man try to sleep separately one day and feel how it affects your sleeping so sometimes it it is like oh i feel lonely something is missing this is more emotional give it a time and you will experience that actually sleeping by yourself you are having more deeper and healthier sleep so you wake up like wow i feel so recharged but you don't need to be constantly together like how you are asleep you are not even aware this person is here you don't need to socialize if he is in another room or in another bed, it's not going to ruin your relationship. Actually, it's adding to relationship, adding more energy. So <clears throat> when you are eating, so today we're going to uh, jump more, of course, into eating. When you are eating, the question is, um, who is sitting with you? What kind of vibes are you having around? What kind of food? It's not only what you eat, it's how you eat. And another thing I want to say is that there is a trendy uh, quote, we are what we eating. So I wanna uh, expand this expression. You are what you digest and you are what you don't digest. It means if you took something that your um, body had hard times to digest, you will become that. So you are becoming everything that you stuff in your, um, in your body. And then the result, you're becoming the result. Your stomach managed to digest easily or was really struggling and you will become that. So <clears throat> the vibes that we are eating, we are eating them. The conversations that we are experiencing during the food we are eating them so the energy of food what is the energy of food uh, so this plate here as i mentioned before that it is very important to eat hot plate right what is about hot plate it's not only uh for the the, the, the digestive fire that I mentioned. Now I'm talking about the breakdown of energy. So this steaming is actually the subtle spirit of food. There are two ways that we perceive that spirit through taste, flavor, and the smell. So uh, when you are cooking, have you noticed that when you are, so let's say you are um, expecting guests, you are cooking four meals, you are cooking and like busy and really loving it. And uh, when guests come, you are feeding them, but yourself, you are not eating much. You feel like fed. You're like, I'm actually not hungry, right? Does it happen sometimes? Why? Because while you were cooking, you were eating that spirit of food, which is you tasted here a little bit there, and you are smelling. So uh, in shamanism, this is why we sage, we clear the space, the smoke. The smoke is the, uh, they say that spirits, they like the smoke. That's why we are saging uh, or clearing, uh, burning something. And the food has the same. If you think of the food, you are bringing raw material, you are processing it, uh, processing it through a high temperature, and it turns into something completely new. This is a process of alchemy, and it's a magic. We don't take food today as magic. We're like just whatever. Yeah, I love cooking. Yeah, uh, I'm good chef. I, everything I do is yummy. 
but it's even more deeper. It's actually for, I would say there are women here who are witches. <laughs> yeah, hooray for the witches. I would say that your kitchen is your number one place for your witchcraft because you are creating an alchemy process. Now, <clears throat> it means that, um, actually I'm gonna refer to that in the next slide because I have a very nice, I think I do, I have a good picture for that. So um, the, 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 again, the energy the spirit of the food is the flavor and the smell. It means that when you are eating, if you are eating fast, you are not going to even connect to that. People are not even chewing properly. Yeah, you're just starting uh, putting food in the mouth and swallowing it, swallowing it. So one of the thing that is a symptom that you connect it is the amount of saliva. When you are chewing for long, you are producing saliva, which is the enzyme for stomach. So the more saliva you have in your mouth that goes together. And remember that, uh, okay, this is just genius. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to hold myself not to jump into everything at the same time. So the more saliva you have, the more juice you have, that juice that helps the stomach. So your stomach is actually longing for that. It's like extra health that uh, digests your food. On another thing, is that saliva is extra fluid. Actually, you know, I'm talking now and I feel like my saliva <laughs> is, is, is so abundant. Let me drink. This is funny. This is somatic response. I just love the body. Whenever I'm talking about something, I feel that in my body. So remember, the human needs to drink more water. This is extra water that you can drink. And saliva in Qigong, in Taoist practice is actually the essence. It's the nectar that holds your own energy that you produced. It's very important. I can tell you from feminine Taoist practice, there is a technique where you actually produce, so you are like making more and more and more and more saliva and you are, you are stirring it, you are enriching it with oxygen and you know how they sell oxygen um, drinks or oxygen cocktails? This is your oxygen cocktail. So there is certain time when you are doing your practice, you are creating a lot of saliva and you are just uh, stirring it, like gargling it in your mouth, making bubbles, 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 which is the oxygen and then you drink it. And this is your nectar. It's the elixir of life. So this is one thing that you can, take today and try. <laughs> of course, your mouth should be uh, clean. I mean, like, uh, not when you wake up or at the end of the day when you are um, doing like meditation, this is the best time to do that. So uh, it means when you are producing more saliva, you have extra fluids, which you need. And this is your own. It's not external. The, the water from outside uh, comparing to that water that you produced, wow, it's nothing. It's really nothing. So when you are thinking that you want to taste the food and to smell, you are going to slow down on your chewing. By slowing down on your chewing, you are producing more saliva. All of this brings you to have uh, actual to um, take the actual spirit of your food. Now, eating rituals during cooking. Let's uh, look into cooking. So what I see, what I saw in my life in different countries when I was traveling or living in different families, I see that, yeah, the kitchen is, a, is, a, is like the, the heart of the house, yeah? Uh, it's where the woman is experiencing her moment of recognition. It's like, yeah, I'm going to cook and I'm going to impress. We have that. This is where men are trying to conquer the world through like whatever strength and business and money. Women are trying to do that through the kitchen big time. Or 
they hate kitchen. So there is um, interesting relationship. I know women who really love cooking and they're into that. And it's a very uh, special moment for them. And I know women who really hate cooking. I was both. <laughs> so where it comes from, because when we are being raised, we first of all, we see the example of our mothers who are most of the time really working so hard at home that then we see a tired mother and we're like unconsciously i don't want to be that i don't want to cook i'm going to hire somebody i'm going to earn money i'm going to build career and i'm going to make somebody cook for me that's going to be so i don't want to be that example or because you are expected so women are feeling tired to deliver or serve their men and their children very often you're like oh now i came home and now i need to cook so when anything is forced again uh, turning back to forcing when anything is forced that becomes even if it's the most amazing spiritual act that will become a violence so first of all during cooking you should never cook when you are feeling forced that's it it's actually better to go to a restaurant or uh make your husband cook or make somebody cook or just wait wait and um work on your state of your mind and your energy and then you can go to cooking because the cooking is a process where you are going to a state of pray in mind this is actual uh, a prayer for woman so uh, in many traditions in jewish in uh, arabic uh, in muslim sorry uh, in uh, yogic yeah in temples there are we see that mostly men are studying scripts and like uh doing that um, reading and whatever it's a prayer it's a prayer time for men when they need to do that and it's very important for women prayer is completely different she prays while menstruating she prays while ovulating she prays while cooking she prays while sleeping so she actually actually woman prays throughout the day if she is constantly consciously living her life so uh smelling and breathing when you are cooking turn all your senses the five senses that can be the reason for addiction they can be also a tool that will help you to connect to the spirit of your food what you need to do is you are drawing your answers you look at the colors you connect to the shape you connect to the um <laughs> i love it okay so um you connect to the form of the food and you are this is a pranayama pranayama is a exercise of breathing this is your breathing exercise while you're cooking inhale the spirit of your food while you are frying something there is an aroma take that aroma because the aroma is the spirit now the speed of cooking should be really really calm so uh, i want to give you a witchy thing that started happening to me in the last years as i'm cooking as i introduced myself to this like this is it this is why i'm supposed to cook this is why i'm a woman so uh there used to be a time and you can relate that when i was multitask you can cook and jump and talk and uh, fix something and talk on the phone and do this because we are so talented, right? Women is literally having 10 arms like a Shiva. So she can do things simultaneously, which is great, but there are times when you need to use only two hands, only two eyes and be completely focused. So as I started doing that and my body realigned my energy realigned now every time when i'm cooking and if i'm distracting myself by something else i swear things fall out from my hands i break glasses uh food gets burned like you know it's not even 
uh, if it's a common sense, you would tell me, well, Aliyah, maybe you just kept your eggs too long on the pan. No, it's not about time. It's always, I know how long I'm, but so my pan is cooking there and I'm going to the living room to do something for just five seconds. I'm coming back. It's ruined. This is the energy. I swear this is how it works. So every time when I am doing something that is not aligned with my cooking witchcraft, it will manifest through a very tragic tragedy experience. Like I break a glass or yesterday I was taking um, dates from the cupboard and I was thinking something not healthy and they all fell. <laughs> so this is the food starts speaking to you. It, like I would say the spirits, your guides start talking to you through the food because the food is living. It's the best transport that can um, pass the information for you. So it's speaking loud and clear. So if you are cooking, you first slow down. If you don't have that time right now, then perhaps you can move your cooking or say, no to everything else so my family they know that when i'm in the kitchen they should be out of there <laughs> because this is my i don't want to talk i don't want to communicate about anything i don't want to talk about politics news or what happened or whatever like don't tell me anything this is just me myself and i and the spirit of food now this is comes to solitude and focus i can really be focused and when we say word focus, sometimes it gives this um, color of like focus. No, it's not that focus. It's actually relax. You are about to relax into your food and relax into your breath and do it in a very calm, solitude way. So here I put, yeah, speech and conversation. I'm actually jumping from one to another, but they are all together. So speech and conversation, exactly. Um, speech is one of the things that is also a part of the witchcraft or the feminine practice, which is very important. What we speak is not just the words because we are supposed to transmit knowledge. If there is something that I am not transmitting knowledge or learning or exchanging some kind of healthy, uh, beneficial information, you know what? All other conversations for me are empty. They are useless. So I'm not interested in just like chatter. But if it's even during cooking, I just want to be inside. And one other thing is that this is not only external speech, it's internal dialogue. I know that from myself and I ask other women, they relate to that as well, because I just wanted to check if I'm not the only one who is, who is like this. So many times when you are alone in your kitchen, you're cooking, you are talking inside. You are cooking your potatoes and you're thinking about what are you going to do tomorrow? Uh, what are you going to say to this person? Or how I'm going to do the uh, webinar? Or I need to put this slide? You know, all of these things. So it's like the cooking time uh, for extremely busy women is the time to think, which is actually, no, it's, it's time. If you have to think about something, think about food, think about Mother Earth, that brought this because what you are eating is actually a part or a particle of the body of the earth. So you're eating earth, you're eating mother. So why don't you think about that? Why don't you think about the color of your cauliflower, the color of your broccoli? So actually you are having the full control over your mind and you can uh, set your thinking process. And then it's a one task concentration and the food that you're going to serve to other this kind of food. Oh my God, it's going to be completely different. So can you please make an experiment? 100% one time, do it 100%. Force yourself actually to do it 100% and then feed this food to somebody. 
you will feel how it is oh my god so this is what i receive from people um who i'm feeding i had a friend staying with me and then with my ex-husband uh it's like every time they say like aliyah your food is like really really amazing and then we had gathering which is celia uh who else Isa knows uh, about a, a singing circle. So sometimes we have a potluck and I brought something and a couple of women were saying like, oh my God, this is so yummy. What did you put there? So I'm telling about ingredients, but I know why it is so yummy. So actually you can have two, three ingredients, but your food would be so extremely special. This is the art. And that breaks you to a simple cooking. You don't need to cook over impress like 10 ingredients and cooking for three hours it can be just eggs it's not about the ingredients now what about eating very similar but different things so a prayer you know ah this is what i wanted to refer and i didn't put this picture there is this very common tradition uh, first it comes from christianity when we hold our hands we sit and we bless the food right or uh somebody told me just recently that oh i had a call yesterday and uh my my client <laughs> oh she's so amazing while we are having a class uh she started eating something so i asked her let's slow down let's take a five minute break and then you can eat she's like no 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 i'm fine i'm fine so i didn't uh, we because we didn't get into that in our practice i didn't say anything let her do that because now it's going to be too direct and violent so i allowed her to do that and i allowed myself to like allow her so but no it's not okay it's not okay to do something while eating don't ever do that you are actually uh this is a big thing it's a coping mechanism for women that's why we when we are emotional, we, our hand is reaching out for that chocolate or for that burger or for that bread, you know, something pasta, whatever. You're like, just, I cannot handle this. This is too emotional. <laughs> or you're not even aware. You're just like, uh-huh, okay. And then what happened? Like this. <clears throat> so stop doing that. Now, um, prayer. There is another, so she told me that lately she forgets to bless her food <clears throat> now there is a trend and fashion about blessing the food so it's a very beautiful but it's not fully honest why because in the beginning you bless the food and then when you start eating your awareness is completely lost so why did you bless the food if you are talking right now uh, about something that is not even adding to your food why did you bless the food so the blessing of the food process and eating the process they are contradicting each other prayer should be the whole process of eating the whole process and guess what you don't need to do that don't need you don't need to because it's a it's a trend you can actually do that while chewing i'm blessing my food I'm blessing my mouth. I'm blessing my saliva. I'm blessing my uh, esophagus. I'm blessing my uh, stomach, my everything. Yeah, I'm blessing while do that. So then blessing is not just words or thoughts and you think like, yes, I did that, Mark. No, you are actually putting it into actions. Otherwise it's empty. Now, second, you are, as I mentioned, taste and smell is the spirit of the food what is the smell so first uh you know this is something weird i do when i go to cafes as well which doesn't happen very often i prefer to cook my food uh so i take the plate and i smell it and somebody tell, told me like no it's okay it's fresh <laughs> it, it looked like as if i'm checking if it's still good or like does it smell good no it's not about that but i'm actually inhaling i'm closing my eyes and i'm inhaling and this also comes from the animal instinct in us you know how uh wolves because 
women love wolves, we, uh, women who run with the wolves. So they are very shamanic and they're very intuitive and sensitive. You know that they will never eat meat that is rotten, even they, if they are starving and dying. They will smell first and feel, and then they eat. So we as females, human females, we can actually smell and sense. And this is sometimes I feel that in my plate, there is an ingredient which I don't want to eat, not because my mouth or my mind, but because my smell sense told me that this is not good. So you inhale and I feel like a contraction or like resistance in my stomach. Stomach is saying, no, please no. I'm like, okay, this is out, right? So eventually, it's all in one plate, but you can actually break down into smelling this smell, that smell. So it's all coming with practice. Now the taste, you put the food in your mouth and you are tasting that. To taste, again, you need to chew slowly. You maybe perhaps need to hold that in your mouth for a little bit, allow to saliva to secrete. And then while you're testing, this is a meditation. You will feel that your food has a burst of new flavors so like a potato or i don't know broccoli that you are eating every day can every time be so different like wow this is so delicious especially if you it's made by your hands now speed of chewing which i mentioned thoughts and focus what are you thinking right now this becomes your internal dialogue Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, it doesn't mean that you cannot think about anything external, but what if you think about something I can offer to you? Think about your gifts, think about your skills, think about your power, think about your gentleness, think about your victories, like, you know, something good because you are chewing and you are adding that because your thoughts becomes the final ingredients into your food and you are taking that in now speech and conversation oh this is such a huge so i've lived in the middle east uh, let me see if no she left okay so drew was here and she can relate to that because she has Lebanese uh, roots. So I lived in Lebanon. Wow, this is a tradition, a ritual. Everybody gather around big table. There are like 20 different dishes and you must eat everything and finish everything. And everybody is talking, yeah? What do they talk? So I'm talking about classical uh, family, not spiritual, not like, I mean, everyone is spiritual, but not practicing anything like awareness. So people talk about politics. People talk about news at work. People talk about relations. People talk about, and most of the thing, they talk about something that spices their life. So let's say if I am somebody who broke up with her uh, husband, and then I'm going to finally see my friend who I didn't see for so long. I need her, I need to share with her. So what? how do we usually meet our friends? We go to a cafe, right? <laughs> and some of you I met actually this way. So we meet in the cafe and we start talking and I cannot wait but tell you. So I start telling you about the drama in my life and she's eating like, yeah, really? And what did he say? Oh my God. Wow, this is all this drama you are eating, right? This is very, very destructive for your body, for your organs who are like, we are receiving, remember you are wide open and vulnerable and raw and you're receiving that conversation in. So first of all, you are allowed to set the topic. If you cannot avoid what happens. So this was my case. I was uh, in that uh, Lebanese family eating that and there are like, Every Saturday, there are like 12 people, 10, seven, and they're talking about different things, sometimes in Arabic, most of the time. So I would create a sense of, it's called 
presence and absence at the same time. So now I'm present, you can see me, I'm at the table sharing food with you, but in myself, I will be totally absent from what is happening. I will detach myself and create a borderline or like a shield. It's not just a protection because actually protection creates a sense of like defense. So there is conflict. I don't want protection. I just going to draw a line through which I understand. This is my process here. I'm eating. I'm connecting to my food. And yes, I can hear others, but this is theirs. It's belong to them. And I am not going to take that. I'm going to take this food. I'm going to bless my food and I'm going to chew fast. And usually I'm uh, whether the first to leave the table or the last. <laughs> The first because I take very small amount or the last is because like, I'm like, I want to choose slowly. I don't want to rush. So uh, you can develop that being absent and present at the same time. And you can implement that in anything you do, present and absent. So start doing that because woman is able to live in two realms, internally and externally at the same time. Now, if you are meeting somebody and this person is having a very strong overwhelming conversation that you feel you don't need to you are actually um, going to empower your voice and your compassion also for that person because maybe this person is not aware you will offer so i always say like wait wait like let's eat first and then we can uh talk about this right or why don't we make a, a special lunch? Let's, let's not talk, experience conscious eating, and then we can talk. Yeah, so it's like you did this, and then you're moving to the next thing. So the reaction that people have, uh, it might seem like you are shutting somebody down, but actually people are becoming grateful. At the end, they're like, you know what? Thank you for bringing this to my awareness. Like it really felt different. And actually maybe I can start practicing that. So you are becoming an example and you are teaching others, which is really great. Now, what do we have? Okay, now we have a big uh, part, last part that I wanna share with you. Uh, oh, no, I didn't finish this actually, yes. So enough is enough. Again, this is when you feel, start noticing you are eating food and then there will be a moment when you will put I have it here. You will put your spoon down or your fork down and you're like talking or looking at something and then you're taking it again. So this putting down is a sign that perhaps it's enough for now. When you caught your mind on that, the mind will resist. It will feel like, no, you are taking that away. I want more. So I have a trick for my mind. I'm putting the spoon down and I'm like, yes, I'm going to give it to you. I'm just going to wait for two, three minutes. So I'm waiting for two, three minutes. And after two, three minutes, my mind is like, yeah, actually, I feel quite full. I don't need to eat anymore. So enough is enough. Then uh, food cannot be wasted, which I mentioned that you are allowed to throw food. It depends on which intention you use. Remember, nothing is wasted in general, in bigger picture. Everything that you are uh, letting go, like half of your plate you didn't finish, you are going to understand that it will eventually go to the earth and fertilize. So you are allowed to throw food, but with correct intention. After eating, so when we finish food, we are not done yet. You are physically done, but you are not. Your body is not down. Actually, now everything is dropped into the stomach. And sometimes you even feel like there is some movement and sounds bubbling and tingling. The, now the stomach is actually going through a very uh, internal. In, uh, it received and now it's going to process. Um, what I practice is just sitting for a few minutes vertically. So walking also is good for digestion, but laying down or sleeping, 
this is one of my uncles is doing that this is like terrible he comes <laughs> to la to home after um, during lunch he has huge meal of meat he drinks one shot of vodka and straight away he goes to bed and i'm like oh my god <laughs> and he's old i'm like i'm not saying anything i'm also uh, practicing not judging but i feel so compassionate because i see the quality of his health and you cannot reverse that anymore so not sleeping after food be there stay with your stomach sometimes i even put my hands on my stomach and i'm like ah receive receive and bless and bless and thank you and thank you for working and thank you for being here so <clears throat> Now I'm going to jump into a table which is coming from a uh, yogic or Ayurvedic tradition. So this is my style. I'm mixing everything and this is how <laughs> I live. For me, it's not different yoga and then Kabbalah and then Tao and Chinese medicine. They're all one. And it actually, they really amazingly support each other. So let me introduce you to three gunas. Three guna, guna in Sanskrit translates as quality of the nature, quality. So everything in the world is substituted from these three qualities. It's purity knowledge, which is the high vibration, rajas, which is passion, action, energy, which is like a middle, and then tamas, which is the low vibration, destruction, impurity, ignorance, and darkness. So if you think of it, sattva is one extremeness, uh, tamas is another extremeness, and the rajas is transition. So because from if you are in a state of tamas, it's very hard to jump and become perfect. Yeah, we need eventually to transit. So rajas works on that level. I'm going to explain from different point of views, like even the ingredients and products. So if we talk about food, sattva is a simply, simple food, simply processed and cooked, easily digested, fresh, pure, and grows above the ground, receiving the positive energy from the sun and moon. Majority of food uh, that are growing above the ground, like all, all of them are good, some of those that are growing inside under the soil are working as rajas. So rajas is something fried, spicy. It's a stimulant that drains or excites your organs, glands, and nervous system. In another way, it's like, um, you know, like something spices and chocolate and like, oh, you feel sexy it's 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 actually rajas is very easy to feel like so you want to uh do something you are if you are somebody who is restless you know it means that your food is uh rajasic okay now tamas is food that does not have vitality leftovers eaten after others this is a big thing for mothers because mothers all of them they have tendency to finish the plate from uh after kids or after husband or if that's a boyfriend so don't ever do that you have your plate and stay within the frame of your plate uh, cooked by depressed or unhappy person now this is i want to say about this so restaurants especially those that are busy external we judge a busy restaurant is a successful restaurant right there are many people it's very uh trendy and popular you want to go there the food there is really delicious but can you imagine what's happening in the kitchen uh well <laughs> this is funny if you go to india and you go to kitchen in their cafes you will be just so so uh, overwhelmed you will never eat there anymore. <laughs> It's, it really looks scary, but it's fine, whatever. But in, even if in Western world, uh, there is amazing high technology kitchen, but the people are running like crazy to be in time to serve. And at the same time, they are thinking about debts, 
sleeping, sex, uh, uh, promotion, more salary, uh, relationship. They are cooking and putting that into the food. So in terms of physicality, the food will taste amazingly. But in terms of energy, how do you deal with that? Because uh, you cannot avoid restaurants. Sometimes you want to go. I go as well. So what I do is a trick. You use your magic. You use your creativity. First of all, you connect to that food. And you are actually charging with your intention. You are putting your energy there. Second is that I want to change something on that plate. So let's think that this is my plate and these are all ingredients, right? So a, a waiter brought me this way. So I'm going to place it here. I'm going to change something in my plate. And then I'm going to add something. It's like, you know, you are uh, by these actions, you are creating different dynamics in your plate. While you are doing that, put an intention that you are recooking it. You are adding your presence or your vibe there. So for me, it works. You can try. Perhaps this is my creation. Like I just made it up. You can create your own. And whatever you create, it will work. Believe me. You don't need to copy everybody or anyone. You can create your own. Maybe you will whisper something to your uh, food. Whatever that works for you and feels good will be correct and will work. Now, this is something I can offer. It. Now, uh, what about the ingredients? So sattva, fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains and I always confuse legumes or legumes. Okay, sorry for my English. <laughs> Honey, nuts and herbal drinks. Now, rajas, caffeine, chicken, onions, garlic, nightshades. Nightshades are the vegetables that grow inside. There are three uh, nightshade vegetables, which are potato, tomato, and eggplants. You would say like, what? Potato? I used to love mashed potato. And uh, if it's a can relate we had this conversation. So potato, why it became so popular? Because it's the cheapest food. It's like corn, soya, bread or potato so um in times of especially it started from america when there was a how you call it global starving or when after revolution after war when there was nothing people didn't have food potatoes and bread was the most because it grows like crazy like grass like weed and it costs really small money. So we were programmed to eat a lot of wheat and potato because it's cheap. But actually, uh, not all people also feel it. It's these products are inflammatory. They cause inflammation. And only women who experience very severe diseases are recommended to cut off and they feel drastic change. So if you wanna try, just try, but it requires a time, like let's say a month, cut from potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplants and see what you feel. So don't take, uh, don't uh, violate your mind, like I'm never gonna eat that. No, give it an experiment because actually the way you will uh, uh, understand which ingredient works for you is that you need to cut something and bring something in, eat it for a certain time and feel the, uh, the response of your body and you will feel that okay so i don't eat that but it's up to you now uh tamas is so chocolate sweets yeah tamas is alcohol meat over processed food frozen food fast food canned food onion garlic as well mushrooms so uh these things are really hard to digest how do they um yeah so in sattva what you are experience peace during eating in rajas it's eating fast and talking so it's action it's passions right tamas is overeating starving 
eating as an emotional reaction. All of this affects the mind. That's why we are experiencing difficulty on emotional and um, mental levels. So pure sattvic food keeps your mind clear. Yeah. Now, uh, Rajas is a restless mind, running mind, rushing mind. Uh, tamas, dull mind, very dark mind, or like drunk, you know, like a zombie. Now, the sattva is a state of truth. Rajas creates desire. You are craving for desire, or in sattva, you are craving for the truth. And the tamas creates sense of fear. So this is amazing. And it actually relates not only to food in anything, books, relationship, places. So these three gunas, you can break down anything in life from this trinity of qualities. And let me put it here. Oh, no, it doesn't go. Okay, so um, what did I want to mention here? Yeah, most of us, we are actually living in the middle line, in Rajas. We fall to Tamas. We uh, humans cannot stay naturally long for, in Tamas. People who stay in Tamas, they are actually for many years, so very severe drug addicts, uh, very severe alcohol addicts. Or uh, if you see people, uh, I feel so sad for them. So people who are in a cart that cannot walk anymore their weight is so massive yeah or people who are cannot walk as well because they are too skinny it's like just bones so it's they cannot eat so this is a state where is you're stuck in tamas but most of us we are fluctuating so we don't stay in sattva because you know it's funny that being in, in constant state of sattva for people is scary and overwhelming. So uh, I have some clients who say that, oh my God, if I will wake up at five in the morning, I know this is like another next level and it's so developed that I'm even scared to do that because I'm gonna be like so powerful. This is amazing. Like not only about sleeping about anything like you are actually becoming the great version of yourself can can you believe that so people women ma mainly are scared to become sattvic it's like do i really deserve all that goodness so let me bring some spice into my life i'm gonna be go back to rajas so it's okay it's okay you just uh first you need to start uh realizing how do you fluctuate what is the pattern of your fluctuation what is the pattern when you synchronize it to your menstrual or menopausal cycle how do you uh, drop and what takes you out and what how long can you stay in sattva can you actually start more you know i would recommend where i want to be is between rajas and sattva i don't want to be in tamas but also tamas can be seen as a, not only negative sometimes you cannot experience sattva unless you've been brought down to to tamas like you need to hit the bottom and then you go into rise to sattva so let's say you you take apple apple is very sattvic right very good but if you take five apples and overload yourself it can become rajas if you will eat too much you will have diarrhea or something else constipation it will become tamas so actually it's not only about the ingredients it's about how much you eat and it's not only about food so if you take a practice of so if you are somebody you are like i'm going to practice this and my food will be really sattvic and then you go somewhere and you see a person eating meat and stuffing and talking and on the phone and you're sitting you're like yuck in your mind right now in that moment all that you ate became tamas okay <laughs> so sattva rajas and tamas it's on 
thought level on words, speech, food, ingredients, everything. But if you overdo or you do it without pure sattvic mindset, that completely breaks down and transforms. This is the trick. Wow. And this is where you are tracking yourself. You can see, especially in this esoteric self-development uh, market, we are so um, overwhelmed by becoming the perfect and then judging others who are not doing that. So if you are somebody who is never drinking alcohol, like me, <laughs> I used to drink a lot. No, no not, not, not alcoholic, but like party and stuff like many years ago. Now I don't drink at all. I don't want it. But I can sit with people who are drinking alcohol and feel good about it because it's not about them. They cannot influence me unless I will open up. You remember? Unless I will choose. So um, actually, one thing I'm going to share both slides with you uh, here and you can print it out and keep it in your let me just see for it or keep it in your phone and it's really nice to remember today is the 8th of march and i'm am in the zone of giving gifts <laughs> Okay, so here is Chinese Meridian sending to you, and here are the three gunas. Okay, you can save to your phone or to your laptop and remember about it and always refer and perhaps start uh, tracking, tracking and sensing. Now, we are going to jump. We are already two hours, and I know many of you are on the other side of the planet and it's late, so uh, I don't want to hold for long. But now it's the time for Q&A. So uh, can you drop your whatever you want to share? And then we will do the practice. So while we are, uh, somebody's typing, if you didn't prepare the prop, we're going to need a prop for um, practice, bring a, apple or a banana or something that you can eat so we're going to do it together now <clears throat> and i'm ready to receive your questions or hesitations or whatever observations oh see yeah see actually seafood is really good so but not all see this is called how to say translated to uh english it's called, if I translate it literally, it's called noble waters fish. All right, next question. Do you do custom meal coaching? Oh, of course I do everything. <laughs> Actually, you know, one of the things when I'm doing the course, I wanted to do that with Ivica, who is here, but we didn't manage. Like I really want to first do a workshop where we have a kitchen and where we can actually have like, if we are 10, 10 knives, 10 cutting boards, 10 something and teach and do that together. Another thing is that when I'm on one-to-one, -one, I'm coming to your house and we are, first we're buying ingredients together. When we're coming to kitchen and we do it together and we eat together, I'm in a way showing you how to do that. Yeah. Can you imagine such restaurant? Somebody will open that small cafe, it doesn't have to be big, where people will cook together with intention and practice and then they will eat with that thing like oh my god i think you can charge so much money you can make only five tables uh for like i don't know maximum 20 people and charge good money and that will be enough they will have so much from that food now let's shall we jump to practice is everybody ready just type yes if you are Oh, okay, we have a question. Do you have any guidance of how to eat when stressed? Not to eat at all. <laughs> there is a tendency to eat when you are stressed. I can see that in myself all the time. And I'm just 
turning myself to another corner of the room and I'm going and doing something else. Um, <clears throat> don't eat stressed. Even if that's hour, remember the hour of the meridians, even if you pass the hour of meridians, you are better to eat in completely different hour, but that food will be uh, very um, sattvic. So sometimes when I have this example, I have a class with a client and we went to deeply some kind of traumatic experience. And then I'm coming home and I'm starving. I'm literally starving. And I know it's like uh, three hours until I sleep. So I'm like, I'm not going to eat. I'm just going to sleep. Let that go out and process. And in the morning, I'm going to have the best breakfast. So when you are stressed, put that plate away. Don't uh, because that is contagious, remember, don't infect your food, heal yourself, and you can do that in one minute, just realign yourself, let it go, and then connect. Okay, so <clears throat> let's take the prop. Okay, so take your prop in your hands. I'm not holding anything because I don't want to chew, so um, my prop will be my lipstick just to feel something. <laughs> take your prop in your hands, close your eyes. First, take a few breaths in order to let go of all the information that I was just talking. For two hours, it's a lot. So I want you to bring yourself into the present moment. Everything that is in the past is out of here. Nothing matters. It's only you your body and your breath. With every inhalation and exhalation, you are coming closer to the center of yourself. Feeling more grounded in your seat, wherever you are sitting. Feeling more present. Relax your belly, give space to your belly. Feel there is a gravitational force in your belly. It creates a sense of subtle weight of energy. And at the same time, the space of your head is clear and flowy. All right, now open your eyes and look at your fruit that you are having. So just use that sense of vision, yeah? The sense of vision of looking at it. You saw this fruit or this food so many times all your life. But now I want you to notice something new. Trick your mind as if you've never seen this before. And you're like, wow. This is the color. This is the shape. And can you imagine how it went through that process of transformation from being just a seed coming into your palms? what journey it made and how much of elements of nature it absorbed. Wind, air, rain, sunshine, soil, everything that exists. And now it's here and it's communicating with you. It's already, it has its own intelligence in a way it knows its purpose, its purpose is to nourish you. So it's a serving and you are taking that with a gratitude. Now, if that's a banana, <laughs> start slowly peeling off your banana. If that's another fluid that doesn't need any cleaning or peeling off, just hold on. So now your fruit is ready so don't rush to before we do that i want to tell you don't rush into anything 
because your instinct, not instinct, the habit that became almost like an instinct will jump forward, step back and control everything. And while you're controlling, focusing, relax. Do it in a relaxed way. Keep your belly relaxed and breathe. So you're going to take, don't yet, but when you're going to take a bite, take a small bite into your mouth place it in your mouth and don't do anything so you're just putting it in your mouth and hold close your mouth and close your eyes so go ahead take a bite slowly take it on top of your tongue close your mouth not mouth mouth and close your eyes breathe relax Relax your jaw, relax everything. And start feeling how a foreign living object is present in the mouth cavity. You can feel the weight, you can feel the presence and your mouth starts reacting to that, notice. There is a reactive uh, mode, it's like, well, now I, I want to chew it, I want to move it, but no, 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 not yet. Perhaps you can feel more watery. So start noticing if water is coming up. Now, instead of chewing that, can you start moving that object like a ball, uh, kicking the ball on the field? You're going to move that object to the left, to the right. So let it roam around inside of your mouth. And your tongue is doing that. So your tongue is so sensitive. It has so many uh, neural sensors. It's like a hand or actually it's, I would say better. It's a, like clitoris. It's actually an upper uh, manifestation of clitoris. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's the only two muscles that are attached only on one side and on the other it's free so it's your hand or clitoris that can sense so now when you are moving that in your mouth you are touching it you are reading the information and energy of that fruit and perhaps you're already feeling that impatience of your mind or your senses is like well come on let's let's chew no, 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 we're breathing. You remember, this is just a class. Of course, you're not going to do the same way when you are eating, but I want to give you an extreme experience so you remember it well. Now, the first chew will be only one bite. Slowly start biting, allowing all the flavors to burst out into your mouth. Make that first bite and slow down. And I want you to feel how the fluids, the fluids are passing the information into your mouth cavity. The saliva is building up. All the sensors in your mouth are active, awake. Perhaps you can feel an echo in your stomach. Notice if there is any movement, it's like, okay, I'm ready, I'm ready. <laughs> now continue very slowly chewing. Don't swallow anything. Only the saliva naturally or the fluids can drip down. Don't um, suppress that, but continue chewing on right side, on left side very slowly and think what is happening right now it's a transformation the fruit that already went through transformation from being a seed into a ripe fruit now is continuing its life cycle this is a life cycle so it's sharing the energy of the mother earth of the father son in your mouth and they say that before the food entered your stomach, it's already nourishing you. 
in your mouth, through your saliva, through your senses. So sense how you are receiving something very subtle. Can you start transporting that throughout your body, into your brain? So you're feeding your brain with the subtle energy of that food. Feeding your heart, passing through the heart. And even feeding your womb. Your womb also loves the fruits. Chew it until it becomes a soup. This is a sign when you can swallow. So this is a, remember it like a mantra. When your food in your mouth becomes a soup, you can swallow that. And when you're going to swallow, swallow it slowly, close your eyes, and maybe you can track and sense how it's going down and arriving to your stomach. Make sure you're breathing, make sure your belly and jaw are relaxed and go ahead now without my guidance, take second bite. We're gonna do, let's do four bites. Yeah, so three bites more you are doing on your own. Because it's very easy to do things when you are guided, but this is not a practice. The practice comes when you do it by yourself. So just remember, and as you are doing that, feel that you are two personalities right now. One is really doing the work and learning something, and the other one who has old habits and constantly reacts like, oh, I just want to chew and, and swallow, yeah? So be aware of both and let them collaborate. I will give you time for these three bites, three swallows. Cooking a soup in your mouth. <laughs> Breathing. Remember, you need to oxygenate your soup. Passing that subtle energy. And then swallowing. I suppose we are going towards the last bites. I feel like I want to ask you to type, but also I don't want you to type. I just want you to stay there with your food. When you are done, close your eyes and place your right hand. So I'm going to remind you where is your stomach. Your stomach is on your left side. Perhaps I am mirroring you. If I'm mirroring you, so this is my, it should be my left. So you're placing your right hand first and left hand on top. This is position for women. Man, they go opposite. The right hand is on top. So placing um, on the left side, just where the lower rib ends, right there on that squishy soft part, like a hollow. Close your eyes, relax your jaw, relax your shoulders, drop them down, relax your arms. When you are holding the energy of your stomach in your palms, you always need to be sure that your arms are not getting tired, that your shoulders are not feeling tensed. So relax your whole body. And now we will do a very short part of Taoist practice, which is called inner smile. So I want you to sense, not from your mind, but internally sense the location and the presence of your stomach. You don't need to be 
um, a scientist or medical doctor to know how it looks, where it is. You can see it through your internal vision and it will be correct. So just feel that there is a organ there. <laughs> Mine is making some noises the organ that just received this nutrition from Mother Earth. It received and now it's containing. Woman's hands have ability to heal. You don't need to be a Reiki master for that. We all have it from, from our nature. So start sending warmth, and kindness into your stomach. The positive emotion of your stomach in Taoist practice is trust. So can you start building that trust between your palms and your stomach and transmit it inside? Trusting that what you have just done is real trusting that your stomach knows its role and mission trusting that you can connect with your stomach and heal and transform and generate more energy trusting yourself Now imagine that that seed that absorbed all the elements and the blessing and the love of the Mother Earth is right now inside of your stomach. How is amazing that? Do we ever think of food in this way? Now I want you to create a smile on your face. Literally raise the corners of your lips up. And your eyes are closed, but you can smile inside of your eyes. Just creating that energy of smile on your face. And you know that smile has such power. When somebody smiles to you, what do you wanna do? You wanna smile back, right? It feels like, oh, wow, like as if sun just rose above you. So right now, you are going to send that smile energy to your stomach. Smile to your stomach. Smile through your face, through your skin, through all that blood and bones. Send everything down and even through your palms. And of course, when you are smiling, your stomach will smile back to you. I want you to start feeling that response. For everyone, it will be different. Maybe you will just feel good. Maybe you will sense how your stomach is relaxing. And maybe there is sense of warmness and tingling. You are looking at each other and smiling. Breathing together. You are welcoming, thanking your stomach for everything that it's doing. for not giving up, for not ever stopping, for not ever complaining, for always accepting whatever you give. Even if it's struggling, it will still continue. Give it three more deep breaths and continue smiling through those breaths.
after the last send final thank you and let go leave your stomach so it can do its mission and you can come back rub your palms place over your eyes eyes are very important organs and they are also having their own consciousness so we want to be gentle before we open them you send that gratitude and kindness and healing through your palms and then you open your eyes and you come back whoa my palms and my stomach became so warm even it's actually very empty and it started giving me like i want to eat so let me know in the chat what did you feel and how it felt for you and what did you sense and by the way very important how was the chewing and eating yes my hands are sweating and 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 hot like wow it's so amazing literally and now you know the thing when you eat like this you realize that you get full by like three bites of the apple because what we want to remember the energy it's not the actual physical thing ingredients so the apple the banana can taste so amazingly wow <laughs> well remember it's a sexual process so now your eating will be making love to your food actually okay banana so <laughs> i love it i love your comment and um yeah that's it it was amazing it was really good breakfast with you energy breakfast this was energy breakfast at tiffany <laughs> so i will see you in one month we will talk about conscious art of sleeping yeah and then maybe making love and menstruating we'll see so thank you very much good night to some of you and good morning to others have amazing 8th of march and i hope your life will be as good as this apple experience or banana that you had love you all goodbye <laughs>